Hello and welcome to Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. It's Patricia Steer with you. My guest is Mike Williams. Mike Williams of the Paul is Dead channel, the PID Hello, channel. Oh, now we've got a little issue here. Sorry, guys. Um, now we fixed it. Mike Williams is also the host of the Sage of Quay Radio Hour. Now, this show, episode 289, is a follow-up to episode 225, done in April of 2018, on Paul McCartney. There is a new book that has come out that has delved deeper into the Has Paul McCartney Died and Been Replaced saga, conspiracy, investigation, or total load of you know what it all depends on who's doing the looking so mike williams is here and what we're going to do is go over for those who are very new to this the 101 on the whole paul mccartney replacement and then get into some of the juicier juicier details mike thanks for being here well thank you for, patricia for having me come back our last show which we did well the first show we did on paul is dead has uh, over fifty thousand views so a lot of people have an interest in the topic Yes, it's um, one of those things that on the surface sounds ridiculous, even to people who are seasoned investigators into some of these things. But once you look into it, you can't, it's like flat earth in a way. Uh, you, can't, you can't go back and you can't deny that there is something going on here. And I think it all goes back to Luciferianism. But that's something that we're going to get to as we get a little further along. That's a bit too heavy to start off with. Okay, Paul McCartney, nice boy from Liverpool. Um, he blew his mind out in a car. Uh, take it away from there. Well, the Beatles are the greatest rock band in the world. Um, some people might argue with that, but most people will acknowledge, especially most musicians will acknowledge that they are uh, and were the greatest band in the world. And so the Beatles uh, started in 1962 and then had tremendous uh, fame as they exponentially grew from 1962 through 1966. And um, in 1966, after the Revolver album was recorded and released, biological Paul McCartney, now this is how the theory goes, the conspiracy goes, I should say, uh, died in a car crash. And depending upon which researcher you speak to, the date could be August, it could be September, it could be November. And Paul was replaced by a double, a lookalike. And it's probably should, well, I probably should add that the double and lookalike got to look like Paul McCartney um, because of a, an extensive amount of surgery, fillers, and they also used latex. So the, uh, the new guy in the band was, um, is Bill Shepard. Some people will refer to him as uh, Billy Campbell or William Campbell, uh, but the, the safest name to go by is the one that he uses as, uh, as an alias, which is Billy Shears. So I'll use Billy Shears for the sake of this discussion. And so Billy took over the band in late 1966. Um, that was part of the deal when he met with Brian Epstein and John Lennon after Biological Paul died. And um, he's been playing the part now for 53 years, since 1966. So we have been listening to and, and watching um, an imposter for the last 50 plus years. People will always ask this question, same one they ask about Flat Earth, why, why the lie? Well, at its very core, um, the Beatles, we'll start with what the Beatles were intended to be, and they were very successful at. The Beatles were a creation of Tavistock from the beginning to end. And the Beatles were created in order to, uh, to engage dramatic social and cultural engineering, to change the culture. So to take as an example, in, in the Western world, we'll, we'll use the United States as an example, you had this very established uh, set of traditional values, Christianity, and, and so on. And so the, the pyramid of power, the controllers, uh, they, decided, well, they decided long ago, because everything is planned way in ahead. Uh, so they have a strategic plan that's in place, and these plans are in place for, for decades in advance of 
when they actually get rolled out. That's the thing. They're always way ahead of, of the curve because that's why they're the controllers, right? So, <laughs> um, so they put the Beatles in play in order to shake that up, in order to break down the old way of thinking, uh, to break down the quote unquote traditional values and to move the population and the masses toward a more um, Luciferian way of life, way of thinking. You can look at how they first appeared when they came out and how they physically, uh, with their clothing and the way their hair was done, uh, morphed and helped form and change and influence society's standards of dress. In the beginning, they had dark suits and ties. Although their hair was a bit long for the time, they still looked like normal, nice boys, but a little wild because they were into rock and roll. But that was the the way they 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 hooked you in. They weren't um, so horrible if you were a young teen that your parents would be very angry that you'd be listening to them. But as they morphed and changed, and then there got to be more of a psychedelic vibe to how they looked, and then a a, a very world peace Thelema way to the way they were, um, they they took their audience and gained new followers along with them for the ride and manipulated everybody without anyone even realizing it was happening. Right. And that's very um, perceptive, Patricia, because what they did was they took the Beatles in the very beginning in the 1962, 63 timeframe, they had the mop tops. And then what they did was they incrementally and very methodically stepped them through the evolution. So coming off of Elvis and so on, then came the Beatles and they were dressed in their suits. They had the, you know, their mop top hair. And yeah, some parents didn't like it, but I guess the thought could be, well, it could be worse, right? It could be worse. They're wearing suits at least. They're wearing suits. And so you can see how even the music uh, evolved over time. So the early albums like um, uh, Please Please Me and, and Meet the Beatles had a lot of cover music still that they were playing and uh, along with original Lennon and McCartney. Uh, material compositions. And then we get to albums like uh, Revolver and before that Rubber Soul. And all of a sudden, you know, we're seeing a very, very different band, very, very different music, a lot more complex and taking um, the listening audience and, and their fans into a very different place musically. So on the Revolver album, as an exa example, there's a very psychedelic song on there, uh, Tomorrow Never Knows. And that was really the Beatles' first foray into the psychedelic era. And then, uh, of course, uh, Biological Paul was still in the picture at that time. And then when he passed away, and the date that I focus on is September 11th, 1966. And maybe we can get into uh, some of why September 11th is that date. It's very important in the occult circles. Um, William Shepard or Bill Shepard, Billy Shears, uh, stepped in. He stepped in in late 1966. Uh, Billy is and was uh, very skilled in his musical abilities. He was uh, highly trained, and he was uh, he was earmarked. He was he was uh, groomed and tapped very early on to take on a very significant role as time went on. And whether he was tapped specifically for the Beatles, that's an open switch, an open discussion. But clearly, because of Billy's bloodlines, uh, he was um, he was marked for very successful and influential types of things in his life. He was going to be a mover and a shaker, and uh, so he got tapped to replace Paul McCartney. And that's when Sergeant Pepper came out. Pepper is uh, Billy's album from beginning to end. Uh, the other Beatles, John Lennon, uh, you know, obviously contributed tracks to the. Um, to the album, but um, Billy was the leader. He was the one that called all the shots from 1967, Sergeant Pepper on. And so Pepper was his, uh, his debut album and it, it took the world, right? By, by surprise. Uh, before that we had Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys and everybody thought that, you know, Pet Sounds was uh, the holy grail of music at the time, and the Beach Boys themselves thought that. And then when Pepper came out a few months later, that was that. So it set a, it set a whole new standard for music. So that was the um, the introduction into into the psychedelic era, 1967, as 
many of the listeners might know was the, uh, the Summer of Love. It was the Monterey Pop Festival, which uh, Billy was, um, was coordinating with uh, John Phillips. And uh, the Monterey Pop Festival was, you know, it was a, um, it was a, a, a- The bullseye of all this cultural change. Of all this cultural change, right? With the bands that they had at the time that played and uh, uh, Free Love, it was the drug culture. Everything kicked off with, uh, with the Monterey Pop Festival. And Billy was behind the uh, the coordinating of that, as I, I said with John Phillips. So um, you know, so from 1967 uh, through 1969 into 1970, uh, Billy was the leader of the Beatles. Uh, it wasn't John Lennon. The story that we're given is John Lennon was the leader of the Beatles. Lennon was up through 1966 when uh, a deal was cut, or I should say, Lennon agreed to uh, to Billy's demands that in order for Bill to take control and reins of the Beatles, that he had to have full control, creative control of the band, and it had to be his band. And uh, John relinquished that control. In the memoirs of Billy Shears, it says that uh, John did that under duress. He was uh, very upset about biological Paul's death, but um, he did agree to it. And so from that point on, uh, Bill Shepard has been playing, or Billy Shears has been playing the role of, uh, of Paul McCartney for more than 50 years, 53 years. Many people feel that um, Yoko Ono is the one that brought about the demise of the Beatles and would you know, influence John Lennon, but indeed it was Billy Shears who called the shots as soon as Pepper came out all the way to the very end, his decision or the people who pulled his puppet strings to end the Beatles, right? No, that's exactly right. Uh, the Beatles, uh, ended because Billy decided to end the Beatles. Uh, there was a lot of stress within the band. Um, there were times when the three other Beatles, John, George, and Ringo, got along with Bill. There were other times when there was a lot of tension. And um, Billy just got to the point where it just wasn't advantageous anymore. It was time to pull the plug on it. Uh, it was not Yoko Ono, even though uh, Billy found Yoko to be annoying because she was always there. But in the uh, in the revised version of Memoirs, it's the this here's the blue book, the blue cover. Yeah. He states in the book in black and white that uh, Yoko was a handler for John. OK, hmm. so that's that was Yoko's role. Yoko's role was not just to be. John's lover and then wife, but she was his handler. Um, yeah. The, the, the colors of the books. I mean, we all know about the red pill, the blue pill, the matrix, and we've got the red book, red cover book that came out first, the memoirs of Billy Shears. Yeah. And then coming out 9 9 2018, and the eight and one and 18 adds up to nine. And well, we all know the significance of the number nine involving the Beatles. Even this episode is. Um, episode that's got a nine in the very last number. And I, even on the thumbnail, I highlighted it in yellow, just to even bring that out. Um, what the, is, go ahead with what you were going to say. The blue and red cover. I, yeah, the blue and red we should, cover. We should talk about that. Yeah, it's yeah, very significant. Should. Yeah, it's very significant. So blue and red represents their Masonic colors. So there's the blue lodge and there's the red lodge. Okay. And so that in the matrix as well is probably where there's a red pill and blue pill. Exactly. And I yep. never knew exactly where that came from. I'm sure there's others too who didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. That's what it is. There's the blue lodge and there's the red lodge and the red lodge outranks the blue lodge. Okay, so just, that's just the a, book cover that came out first was the red. That's the book that came out first, right? The red cover came out first, uh, September 9th, 2009. That's when Billy first really started the uh, um, the full-blown disclosure process. It was All back right, in 2009. So it makes sense. The red book kind of outranks the blue book because it's the bombshell that came out. And the blue book is a follow-up with more information, deeper information, and darker information. Yeah. So what happened with the red book? Uh, the red book is a great book, by the way. So if anybody's read that, you'll know that there's a lot of information in there. But it was a, a bit more cryptic in the way that Billy via Tom, Tom you Harry is the, uh, the encoder. We can call him the author or the ghost writer, but Tom encoded the book and we can get into that a little bit also, what encoding actually means. Um, 
but there, it was ambiguous in certain areas and the reader really had to scratch their head sometimes to figure out w where Billy was going or what he was trying to explain. Um, so there were many times in the book, in the Red Book, where uh, some of the passages in the narrative was uh, a little difficult to really pinpoint. Like, what's he really saying type of thing? So fast forward nine years, 2018, because it's the nines. Um, Billy made a decision that he wanted to further push along the disclosure. And so um, I was doing shows going back to 2016 on the memoirs of Billy Shears. Uh, and I should say, as I say in every show, I have nothing to do with the book. I'm not compensated by it. Uh, the reason why I talk about the book a lot is because I have found it to be, out of all the books I have read on the Beatles, to be the best foundational uh, book to work from in order to try to prove or disprove the conspiracy. Because the, the book is just packed with information and details. It's, it's just incredible how much information is in the book. So about four months before um, Tom was told to update the book, uh, I got an email from Tom and Tom said to me, hey, Mike, uh, William, they refer to him as William, is uh, looking to speed up disclosure. And Tom didn't know why. And he had said to me, I, I don't know why. He's, I, I didn't get a reason. They just said that we need to put out another version of the book, an updated version of the book with more I was, detail. I was thinking it's because he's getting older and maybe he has an illness that's not yet been disclosed to the public. Well, I think, um, yeah, I think that could be, that crossed my mind also. I also believe that uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Billy is pulsing the, the level of awakening with regard to who he is. And I, I think that it could be also that they were not um, maybe as happy as they, they would have been or could have been. Uh, maybe they were thinking that it would be a more aggressive awakening. Maybe, I'm just saying. So, so Tom, he contacted me four months before the, uh, the revised version of the book came out. And he said to me, you know, Mike, you're doing these shows. And um, so could you give me, uh, you know, four or five questions that keep coming up that yet people are sending to you where people are unsure or scratching their heads or, or looking for more detail? Because I can include that in, in the revised version of the book, the uh, September 9th, 2018 version. So I gave Tom uh, four or five uh, topics that I said that needed to, ha needed to have further clarification because people were stuck on these things, myself included on, on some of these things. So um, some of those questions had to do with uh, Billy playing the role of Vivian Stanshaw in the Bonzo Dog Band with Neil Innes. Um, the first book talks about that. It admits that Billy was in the band, but it was still very difficult to uh, for some people to get their heads wrapped around because how exactly did that work? In the new book, Billy explains exactly how it worked. Uh, also, with regard to his early role, when he played the character of Phil Ackrell, when he was playing with um, Denny Lane in the band uh, The Diplomats back in the, the very early 1960s. Um, so anyway, I, I gave Tom these questions and I had no foreknowledge as to whether he was going to use these questions or I had no idea. Uh, much to my surprise, and uh, I was very happy to see that he did answer all of those questions that I had submitted. And so the, the book, the blue book, really goes into a lot more detail. It, it gets away from the ambiguity. Tom has added, I, I think it's 66 footnotes. Okay, so there's the number 66. Uh, to further explain more about how things went down, uh, how things were done, uh, how things were, were navigated. So uh, he gets into a lot of detail about uh, the structure of the Illuminati. He talks about uh, Luciferianism and Satanism and the, uh, the concept of free will which they call free agency. Uh, he talks about, um, he actually gets into the uh, the moon landings being faked. 
hoax, the uh, that 9-11 was an inside job. Uh, Mark Devlin and I talked about this as to why that was included in the book. Mark asked me for my opinion on that. And um, the reason for that is because what Bill is, is doing is as part of, part of this disclosure process, he's looking to bring those that who are awake or awakening into the inner circle some more so that you can understand how this works. And also to ensure that the whole Billy Shears, Beatles, uh, Paul McCartney discussion doesn't just focus on Tavistock and the Beatles, the Beatles and Tavistock. So what Bill is doing via Tom is connecting all the dots and explaining that this pyramid of power, that's what I call it, the pyramid of power has 66 degrees within it. The first 33 degrees are the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The next 13 degrees are the degrees of the Illuminati. And there's 20 degrees above those 13. And those 20 degrees are degrees that nobody knows who's there. These are essentially hidden beings, people, uh, you know, truly people that are invisible. So Billy Shears, the person who is currently playing Paul McCartney, most of the time anyway, I mean, we don't know 100%, is basically in the Illuminati. Yeah, yeah. So he is in the Illuminati. And this is something that I had uh, surmised very early on because of the level of disclosure. So within the pyramid of power, we'll, we'll talk about Freemasonry, you attain a certain degree and you are only allowed to know up to that degree. Anything above that degree is knowledge that you're not going to, to get or to understand until you achieve that degree. So when I read the first book and I was uh, reading the chapter on, uh, on Freemasonry, I thought to myself, uh, well, he's got to be in the illuminated degrees, in the, one of the 13 degrees, because he's talking about structure within the pyramid, about Freemasonry, that if he were still a Freemason within the 33 degrees, I'm not so sure he'd be able to talk about, it, you know? So, uh, so in the blue book, there is a footnote, excuse me, there is a footnote that uh, Tom has in, in the book. And uh, to paraphrase, uh, he, it says that Tom, excuse me, that Bill is in the Illuminati. He is the Illuminati. And uh, the other ways that I picked up on it, Patricia, was I would watch Billy very closely, like when he was with uh, other Freemasons, as an example, um, David Letterman, uh, Barack Obama, all of your presidents are Freemasons, by the way, folks. Um, the country was founded on Freemasonry. And they always deferred to Bill. It was just this body language and, and so on. And you can tell if you watched closely that Billy had a higher rank. And so I would watch this interaction. Interesting. I've seen, and maybe we all have seen, Billy Shears, a.k.a. current Paul McCartney, not bio Paul, interacting with, I believe it was David Letterman, where he admitted outright that he isn't the original Paul McCartney. Yeah. And this is the free agency that you're speaking of. And th this is the free will. And it's up to us to understand that they're putting it in plain sight. Yes. We are the ones, it's on our own shoulders to awaken and understand what's going on. Not just that, you know, Bio Paul's dead and they replaced him. On the surface, that seems like no big deal. If, if I had a band and the lead singer, you know, was no longer with us, I'd get a person to replace he or she. That's not a problem. But this is, this is the molding of public consciousness. This band was, was so important in that. They needed to continue that going on. And whether or not Biopal was killed in a satanic ritual, which is another interesting concept to all of this, or he just died in a car wreck like anybody possibly could have, that's one of those things that's up for debate. But these the Freemasonry that is it, it went on between, I don't know if you call it Freemasonry, the um, the you know, and I know, wink, wink, nod, nod, that was going on when I saw the uh, talk show with uh, David Letterman and Paul McCartney, where he ba basically told us all the truth about what's going on, right. was, was eye-opening. But to the average person who doesn't know, they just thought it was a joke. 
Yeah, they thought it was a joke and he was just playing off on the quote unquote, the rumor, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a great interview to go back to because uh, I have been trying to um, educate my audience and folks that listen to the shows on what the, the Masons refer to as masterfully speaking. So when a Mason masterfully speaks, they can reveal a tremendous amount of truth, but they have to do it in an encoded way. So that's how Billy speaks. Billy speaks in, in, an, in an encoded way. I mean, he, and you have to decode it. Um, on, on the show with Mark, I, I used a, a quote for, that's attributed to Confucius, which says that signs and symbols rule the world, not words and, and laws, right? So when you learn the signs and symbols, which includes uh, uh, the, the, um, the technique of masterfully speaking, you will understand what it is that they are telling you. See, with the Illuminati, within the pyramid, they are under no uh, obligation to convince you of something. They will put things out there in plain sight. And then it's up to you to apply your God-given gift of intellect and reasoning to be able to see the truth. And this is how they operate. And that's why it's so hard to change the world, Patricia. It's because most people don't use the God-given gift of intellect and reasoning. They, you know, they follow. Uh, they, they give their will up and they hand it over to authorities. Right? And they'll even fight on behalf of the authorities, as exactly. uh, we've all seen in the fight scene in the movie They Live. Um, yeah. You can try and to force people to put on those They Live glasses all you want until you get into a barroom brawl, basically, and you're down on the ground, you know, exchanging punches. And some people will still refuse to see what's right there in front yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I, I explain to folks. And, and some folks uh, get really upset with me when I say this, <laughs> because I tell them that uh, Billy has been telling us since day one that he's not Paul McCartney. They have been dropping clues every which way from Sunday since June 1st, 1967, when they released Pepper through today. He's still doing it today. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the clues today are becoming more and more overt. There are now mainstream articles that are being published about the, the McCartney conspiracy, about Paul is dead. It was just one, uh, two days ago, I think it was Buzzfeed put it out there. You know, and they do it in, in, in a way in which they're, they're trying to you know, poke at those right. folks that, right? Uh, or following or researching or believe the Paul is dead conspiracy, but that's how they do it. Right. So they're Buzz telling Feet, you. BuzzFeed and all of these, um, these, these taste makers of our day using the electronic medium have taken pot shots at flat earth and other quote unquote conspiracy topics, right. but they are putting it out there. Exactly. So there's a reason why they're publishing those articles. It's not because, you know, they're scouring YouTube and, and they're saying, oh, look, there's that guy, Mike Williams. He has a Paul is Dead channel. Let's go do something about Paul is Dead. No, this is all coordinated and orchestrated. This is part of an overall process of disclosure. So, But, but we don't expect, at least I don't anyway, I don't know about you, that tomorrow on, um, you know, BuzzFeed, ABC News or whatever, that Paul McCartney is going to come out and go, okay, everyone, I have an announcement and tell everybody who he really is and what went down. I don't expect anything ever to come out on mainstream media straightforward like that about Paul McCartney, about any of the shooting events, or about Flat Earth. No, no. It's it's going to be a process of uh, continued, incremental, methodical disclosure. Mm -hmm. In other words, what they're going to do is they're going to continue to push it out bits and pieces. And then eventually, hopefully, a critical mass of people will get it. And that's ex exactly what they're doing with Bill. People have said to me, Mike, when is he going to own up to this? You know, when is he going to stand in front of a microphone and say he has been playing a, a character, Paul McCartney, for 53 years? They said, well, it's never going to happen. Um, for one, and I, I mentioned this on the show with Mark Devlin, I don't need to be told that. I already know he's not Paul McCartney. You see? In fact, if he came out and said he was, or if uh, President Trump came out and said the earth was flat, I'd almost not believe it because of who they are. And we all know that they're not telling us truth. So, 
yeah, I mean, they're not going to come out straightforward and say, no, no, they're they're not feeding it to us. That's what they have to do. I I have been told that uh, full disclosure with regard to Billy will come out after he passes away. It's not going to happen while he's alive. Um, But he's doing a lot of disclosing. That's the thing, you know, and if people pay attention uh, to uh, what he's doing and what he's saying, I mean, for instance, there is a a video that he put out called Who Cares, which is uh, immersed in Illuminati symbolism and occultism. It is immersed in it. And it's mind boggling to me that anybody would watch that video and not at least take a look at it and say, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? You've got the spirals in the background. You've got, he has a monarch butterfly on his lapel. He's, everything is decked out in black and white, the colors of duality and polarity. Um, yet, you know, you and I and, and those, I guess, who are watching this are in a minority. Most people but- are going to watch something like that. And, you could play the devil's advocate and say that he knows all about conspiracies and people have said this to me. And so he's just using all of it, throwing it all out there with both guns blazing, monarch butterfly, mind control programming, black and white spirals, etc., just to poke fun at it all. And he really is bio Paul. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a form of denial. Right. Agreed. <laughs> that's, that's denial. Um, no, he's, he's not biological Paul. Um, you know, I have, done an enormous amount of research into this, Patricia, as you know, and um, he is uh, Billy Shepard or Billy Campbell, Billy Shears, and he's disclosing, he's disclosing. What people have to do is get out of denial mode, break down the barriers that you've created for yourself, drop the idol worship. That's really what it comes down to, especially with a lot of these rock stars and these musicians. It's idol worship. Oh, I love them. I love the music. I remember when I was a kid, you have to drop it. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's something that you don't want to do. Look, it was very difficult for me. You're a musician. You've got laboroflovemusic.com. You grew up with the Beatles. In right. fact, the Beatles, I remember from talking to you previously, got you to pick up a guitar and be a musician in the first place. Right. That's right. And so it was a very, very hard pill for me to swallow. But I had to take a step back and say, okay, look, I'm not going to get anywhere. I'm not going to progress uh, in my knowledge and my understanding of how the world works, if I'm just going to be static and stand in place and run in place. So let me just, let's just push through it. Let's push through the fear because that's really what it comes down to at the end of the day for many people. It's fear based. I don't want my world to be turned upside down. I, I don't look, most people think they have an understanding of the world. They believe that, you know, it's, it's defined for them. It's in a big box. It's got a nice bow slapped on top of it. And so when you turn around and tell them, oh, by the way, your box doesn't have everything in it that it needs to have in it, you know, they short circuit. And, um, and, that's, and that's what I've encountered uh, to an amazing degree with this whole uh, Paul McCartney conspiracy. And, and it, you know, Beatle fans, uh, a lot of them are just like loathe me. <laughs> well, there are other researchers you are one of the preeminent researchers, but there are others and you and they disagree on certain aspects of this. So just like flat earth, there's infighting and the same thing with Paul is dead investigation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are other researchers and uh, look, I I respect all the researchers because at the end of the day, those that are looking into this, uh, we agree at least uh, at a very base level that biological Paul McCartney was replaced back in 1966. Okay. Now, from that point forward, it becomes uh, a debate with regard to what exactly happened, how it happened. Uh, but that's okay. It's it's okay to have uh, that debate as long as it stays civil and we have civil discourse. It's okay to agree to disagree. Um, but you're right. I mean, even in any conspiracy, flat Earth, McCartney, geoengineering, vaccines, just wherever you want to go, JFK, Everyone's 9-11. A <laughs> yeah, you're going to have different uh, thoughts and ideas and theories about what happened. Uh, but we have to take a step back and take it at a very base level. And the base level is, well, you have at least woken up to the fact that something happened and that something that happened does not jive with the official story. Okay, so we can apply that to flat earth, we can apply that to 9-11, to JFK, to anything. 
to McCartney. Um, so it's a very slow, incremental process, this whole awakening um, process, Patricia. It's not something that's going to just, you know, flick a switch and tomorrow everybody's going to be awake. Uh, people who are doing uh, truth work or alternative research work, you know, we're table setters. That's what we're doing. And it, uh, it could be very frustrating at times because uh, you, you do bump up against a lot of pushback, a lot. Well, you yourself have put a video out somewhat recently saying that you're not going to abandon researching Paul McCartney and PID Paul instead, but you're going to put it on the back burner for a while and focus on other things that you are interested in with the Sage Quay Radio Hour. And one of those things is somewhat connected to the whole Paul McCartney thing. It's uh, Thelema, Luciferianism, Satanism, and this sort of thing. But you've been doing a round of interviews lately, and this is one of them on this channel, where you're kind of saying um, farewell, but not goodbye to the whole Paul McCartney issue, because you've got life to live. Right, right. So what I've explained to folks is the reason why I'm sunsetting my ongoing Paul is Dead research is because I have been digging into it for two and a half years. I mean, really digging into it. I do work with um, probably a half dozen other researchers um, that we stay connected and we communicate via email and Skype where we share ideas and thoughts. Uh, and some of these folks are just absolutely brilliant in their fields. Uh, one of them is um, uh, Richard Balducci, who, who I'm going to have on my show who is uh, phenomenal uh, with his understanding of the occult, just amazing. So he has taught me a tremendous uh, amount uh, and given me, just enlightened me about what occultism is and how it actually works. Uh, I'm still learning, uh, but it, it's, it's people like that where we, we came together and you know I have a certain level of expertise in, in certain areas, uh, Richard has his, uh, Wendy has hers and, uh, Vicky has hers. And I mean, it's just a bunch of folks. Mike has his, we came together and, um, we, we pulled it and we, we painted a picture. I think a very cohesive, coherent picture of, of what happened. Now, some people want to debate it. That's fine. But at the end of, at the end of the day, uh, I'm going to stand by the picture that I'm going to put together, maybe not here today, but by the end of June, I'm going to do a full presentation on what happened, why it happened, who, and who were the players. So, um, so you get to the point, Patricia, where you reach diminishing returns. In other words, I'm not really getting anything more out of this. I feel like I've learned as much as I can learn from it. I've gotten out of it as much as I could get out of it. And now it's time to move on to something else. I, I, don't, I don't like to stay static. I'm not one of these people that likes to just, you know, run on a conveyor belt. Well, you've um, also helped a lot of people and opened a lot of minds. That's something that you fail to recognize about what you've done. Uh, what you've dropped some gems for people and it's up to them to take it from here. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly how I look at it. Um, I have, I, I've introduced most of the, the truth of the world to Me, the concept of mass simply speaking. Yeah, I remember our first time we did a show together yeah. about a year ago in 2018, and I hadn't, I didn't have the memoirs book. I didn't really know about Thomas U. Harriet. Even when I read it, I didn't understand there are three different ways to read it. They, right. I just read it as is, and the coding. We need to get to that definitely. Yeah. Um, so I really um, I appreciate what you've done, and um, I know a lot of people do. So. We are looking forward when you put together the the big presentation, the final. Yeah, the big hurrah. ones. <laughs> the big one's going to be a big one. I'm going to cover a lot of information in that presentation. It will take the McCartney conspiracy from cradle to grave, and uh, you know I've, I've already started the outline. It takes forever, as you probably know, to put this stuff together, putting the slide presentations together, sequencing it, doing the voiceovers, and so on. So what happened, Patricia, was as I was reading this book, <laughs> okay, I began to have the immediate revelation that the death of biological Paul McCartney is actually a subplot. Hmm. So what it is that we really need to start focusing on, at least me, is I needed to understand more about Luciferianism, Satanism, 
Some will use Luciferianism and Satanism interchangeably. I needed to understand a lot more about this man, Alistair Crowley. I needed to understand more about Thelema, and you will get that out of Crowley's The Book of the Law. So there's a lot of work that I have to do now. And um, as I've been telling folks, the reason why I'm getting into this is because the controllers, the people and beings that control our realm, this is their ideology. This is their philosophy. Uh, these are their tenets. This is their doctrine. The Illuminati, or the vast majority of the, of the Illuminati, subscribe to Thelema, which is Alistair Crowley's religion. And they're going to be Thelemites out there that don't like me to attach the word religion to Thelema, but, you know, uh, for lack of a better way to kind of construct it for the audience. Uh, so it's important for us, all of us, to understand this and to stop uh, flying blind, because that's really what it is, you know. Uh, you're flying blind if you don't understand this stuff. And understanding it for me is not just listening to somebody tell me about it. Um, I really have to sit down and dig into it and I have questions and I'm going to have to myself uh, dig in and answer my questions. And now that's not to say that if I don't find good videos or good interviews where, you know, somebody's going to really uh, offer up some very helpful and in informative information that I won't listen to it. Of course I will. But uh, it, it's a deep dive that we need to take because too many of us, and I was in that that uh, classification too, we don't really understand what Luciferianism is. We don't understand Satanism. We don't understand Thelema. We don't understand Aleister Crowley. And uh, so we really need to understand that if the people that are running the joint, it, those are the rules, The and like I said, the doctrine that they play by. That's the language they speak. And we're walking around not understanding the language that our controllers speak. I mean, how how ridiculous is that? We exactly. Need to begin. And um, there's a connection, of course. People are wondering, why are they talking about Luciferianism, Satanism, and Paul McCartney? What's going on? Well, there's a connect. There's many connections, but one yes. of those connects Paul McCartney slash Billy Shears, uh, maybe bio Paul, to um, Aleister Crowley, and also yep. to Barbara Bush. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, in the Blue Book, Billy tells us uh, two things, two very important things. Uh, the first thing is, is that uh, he was subjected to, at a very early age, his earliest memory going back to the age of three, he was in a uh, mind control program. Okay, so Billy going back to three years old was in a mind control program. And then also in the book, he says that uh, he was uh, tutored by Aleister Crowley. Now, Billy was born in 1937. He's five years younger than Biopaul. Biopaul was born in June of 1942, which, by the way, is Gemini 2, right? Wow. <laughs> okay. And um, so here we have Billy being in a mind control program and tutored by Aleister Crowley up until the age of 10, because in 1947, Crowley passed away. So the big question that some of us are still working on, and I, and I do have some of the folks that I'm working with are looking into this. Some folks are really good at ancestry and genealogy and stuff, trying to figure out whether Crowley was actually his father or uh, a bloodline or just a, a bloodline relative. It's definite based upon the book that he is a bloodline relative of Aleister Crowley. I'm talking about Billy Shears, William Shepard. Because in the book, in the blue book, he says that he is a descendant of William Wallace. Okay? William Wallace going back, that's the, the character that Mel Gibson played in Braveheart. Yeah. Right? right. And Billy says that although Mel's acting was very good, it wasn't very accurate. I'll just say that. Again. And he's been he's been seen wearing a Scottish kilt before as well. Scottish. He also wears Irish, the Campbell uh, tartan. Um, but he wears both, Scottish and Irish. And, and I believe that's so because, uh, and I, I have to do some more work into this, but I believe the Campbell name is actually on his mother's side of the house. 
So Billy will switch off between Irish and Scottish kills. Okay. So that's just, uh, that's just a theory that I have right now that I need to pursue some more. Or maybe so even he though, likes those patterns. We don't really know. <laughs> or, he, or he likes those patterns. <laughs> yeah. But I, but the way, the way Billy is and the way Billy thinks, everything that he does is symbolic. So he has these bloodlines. He has a bloodline that goes back to William Wallace. He makes this very clear. He goes back. So he has blue blood. In the blue book, he says that uh, they refer to William Wallace as the hardy warrior. And he left a clue for us. And the clue was uh, Google Crowley and the hardy warrior, something to that effect. I forgot exactly what he said, but it's paraphrasing. So lo and behold, I go onto Google, I type in Alistair Crowley and Hardy Warrior, and boom, this website comes up and it says that the name Crowley has its ancestry going back uh, to the Hardy Warrior. So Billy's telling us his ancestry goes back to the Hardy Warrior. We know the, Cro the Crowley surname goes back to the Hardy Warrior. The Hardy Warrior is William Wallace. So. Bill is bloodline related to Alistair Crowley. Now, could Crowley be his father? Could be, yes, and here's why. Crowley was uh, very much into um, sex, magic, sex magic, ritual sex magic. Now, if you go on uh, Wikipedia, you're going to see that he had four children. I think it's four. But we have no idea how many children Alistair Crowley fathered through sex magic. So William could actually be the illegitimate child of Alistair Crowley. Now, another thing that he mentions in the book, which was another clue for us all, is when he talks about 9-11 and how disappointed he was that his relatives were involved in orchestrating 9-11, well, who was he referring to? Right, when you look at his father, when you look at his mother, there aren't the connections. Barbara Bush. Until you look at Barbara Bush. Barbara Bush, so. going back to the Pierces. And so that was another clue for us all. So it gets really weird because that would say that he and Barbara Bush, a brother and sister, right? Um, not by the same mother, step brother and sister, I guess you could say, right? So um, the, the point I'm trying to make here is, and, and you, you said, well, why are we talking about Luciferianism? Is that the pyramid that I, I talk about, the pyramid of power, is Luciferian. And that pyramid, as I mentioned before, the, the Illuminati, the vast majority of them subscribe to Crowley, to Thelema. And, uh, you know, Thelema basically says that uh, you live your life based upon pursuing your true or pure will. That's what you're here to do. You're here to optimize and fulfill your life in some that's way on the surface for those who don't look into it deeply that sounds good be you be all you can be nike just do it 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 sounds very freeing and very shall i say 60s or 70s but there's a much darker aspect to that which is yeah crush other people kill other people use other people and abuse other people right and, and so so those uh those who are Luciferians uh, will say that, well, uh, we don't all subscribe to that. So just like any other religion, there are uh, the extreme factions that exist. And so, uh, so you're going to get an argument. So if anybody who's listening to this right now is a Luciferian, they're going to take issue with uh, us saying that uh, this is what they do. They just engage in ritual sacrifice and they kill and hurt people. They're going to say, look, like anything else, there's the, the really dark aspects and then there's the, you know, the good. So we have the same polarities within Luciferianism. Now, I'm not defending them, I'm just saying this would be their argument. Like in any and, religion, there's good yeah. and bad. So this is true. So the Luciferians, uh, we, all, we talk about it all the time. We talk about polarity. We talk about duality world, black and white. How do you... You know, how do you experience love if you don't know hate? How do you know good if you don't know bad? We will talk about this. And um, in fact, the, the whole New Age movement, you ready, folks? Because some of you are going to just, you're gonna, your heads are going to pop off, is, uh, is Luciferian. 
So the, the New Age movement was introduced by Tavistock through the Esalen Institute to roll out Luciferian philosophies. Right? Luciferians will talk about uh, chakras. Uh, how many people do, do we know who say that they are light workers? Right? So they, many. And they even... work for the light. Who's Lucifer? Lucifer? Lucifer is the light bearer. The light He's bearer. the bringer of light. None Again, of those folks. things ever appealed to me growing up. And I'm not saying that I don't have aspects of myself that enjoys natural things and things that our body is trying to communicate to us about how it needs to be treated. But there's an aspect to that whole new age philosophy that always just felt often wrong to me. When I would meet people who said they were light workers, something inside me said, stay away. Yeah. Yeah. Some of it... Um... You know, I, I uh, am a, um, a hypotherapist, so I get into areas where uh, I know what it's like to work with energy and, and to work with the mind and so on. But I, re I agree with you that, you know, there are um, uh, aspects or components of the, of the New Age movement. And I'm not a New Ager, by the way, by, by any stretch of the imagination, that I always found to be standoffish. I, I, just, I just didn't connect with it. Exactly. Right? So, uh, but the point I'm making is that all around us, we live in a realm of Luciferianism and its reach is, um, it's full spectrum. It's full spectrum control. And um, that's why it's very important to understand what this is all about. If you're going to avoid it and you're going to think that you know all you need to know about it uh, because you subscribe to a certain other belief system, then you're going to put yourself at a disadvantage. You know, that's my view. Uh, because they control everything. They control your media, they control your entertainment, they control your music, they control your governments, they control your military, they control your justice systems. They control everything, everything. Uh, it all, most of it funnels through the Committee of 300 within the, uh, the Pyramid of Power. So, um, so the reason why the whole poll is dead uh, conspiracy is tied into this is because in the book, uh, Billy tells us about Paulism, hmm. right? So what Paulism is, uh, its main obje objective is to build a spiritually infused counterculture. So when they talk about a spiritually infused counterculture, now we're talking about the controllers. This is what the controllers are doing. Paulism is a, a, um, a form of Luciferianism. It's a form of Satanism. And to be able to remold the world, to pull out the old traditional values, the old traditional belief systems, religious systems, um, educational systems and all that, they are rolling out the Beatles being, being a huge piece of this rollout with everything else, like the New Age movement and so on, to, to implement this change. And, and the change is, what is that change? The, the change is that they're working to create a one world government and one religion. That's what they're looking to create. One world government and one religion. What is that religion? Well, the religion's going to be Luciferian-based. It's going to be Thelema. Some people, like I said, will use Satanism and Luciferianism interchangeably. Um, Luciferians will uh, argue that they are not interchangeable, although both um, have their philosophy and their, their ideology based in fulfilling your true will. Luciferians would make the argument that they balance it between the physical or the material world and the spiritual world spiritual realm. So, so if you look at like a scale of justice, the Luciferians will say the scales are balanced and we stay objective. We never attach ourselves to any kind of a belief system. We don't join clubs. We don't join cults. We don't do any of that stuff. And they define cults as anything that you attach yourself to that tarnishes your ability to be objective. That's how a Luciferian will uh, would, ex would explain their approach to to living their life, their existence. Again, this is my understanding based upon the research I've done. They will argue that Satanists, uh, those scales I was just talking about, it's tilted too much in the material world. 
is too much material world focus and not enough spiritual. That's what a Luciferian might say about a Satanist. And so um, it gets to be a very, very interesting dialogue, Patricia. It really does. Because, you know, we're using terms that many people, myself included, at one point, were very uncomfortable talking about. Very uncomfortable, you know. Um, I, I bought a book recently. And I'm not hawking these books, folks. I'm just saying some of the books that I read. Richard Page, Luciferianism, Alter Ego. These are some of the books that I'm starting to dig into to understand the belief system and, and how they think and how they operate and how they approach life. So, you know, I, I think we, we as a truth community have got to uh, start breaking down some of our self-imposed restrictions and barriers that we've put on ourselves. You know, I, I'm not going to go read anything on Luciferianism because if I do that, you know, something wicked and bad's going to happen. I'm not going to truly, really try to understand Satanism, because if I do that, something wicked and bad might happen. If or you don't you... understand these things, that's when something wicked or bad might happen. Yeah, that's the thing. Well, well uh, wicked and bad things are happening because right? exactly. And this is look why around. the world is <laughs> look around. Exactly. This is why the world is uh, is in chaos. It's because that, uh, you know, people are not understanding the realm. They're not understanding how it's governed. They don't understand how it is that it operates. And as I've mentioned before, the, the doctrine and the tenets of the people that are running the show, they don't understand it. And if you don't understand it, then yes, you're going to be at a severe disadvantage. So know? by reading these sorts of books, that doesn't mean you're becoming a Luciferian or no. a Satanist. It just means you're going to understand the mindset of those who wish to control us and in large part are controlling the greater society. Yeah. I mean, look, I go back to this. It's very basic. We were born and we were born with the God-given gift, as I mentioned before, of intellect and reason. It means use your brain you know, and go explore and go discover. That's what life is really all about. It's about exploring and discovering. That's what it's about. And as soon as we start to box ourselves in, then we're going to have areas of our life that are unfulfilled or sub-optimized. You really do want to optimize your, your, your knowledge and then take your knowledge and apply it and uh, become wiser. And then you have wisdom. Um, so th this, has been, this has been my path. And this is how uh, I have been trying to explain it on, on various shows. Uh, and that's a big reason why I said I was going to sunset the whole McCartney thing because I got what I got out of it. And I realized that it opened up another door for me to go explore. And so that's the door I'm going to head down. And like I said, I'm going to have Richard Balducci on my show. And um, the the stuff that Richard has and the information he has is going to be, it's going to be mind numbing. It really is. It's just going to blow people away. Um, I'm hoping that I can do him justice hmm. because his level of knowledge is just, it's just so up here that I know I really have to do a lot of homework to make sure that I at least sound halfway intelligent and track with him when I do the show. I mean, you know how that is, right? You get yeah, some I feel like, like that oh, talking God. to you. So. <laughs> no, don't, don't. But yes, when you do this show with Richard, um, I guess we'll find out. You'll give us some notification. How long in the future until this is going to occur? Well, we had some technical difficulties. <laughs> Happening all over YouTube and Google, right? Uh, like a day or two ago, we were supposed to do the show. So we're going to do it next week. It's going to be pre-recorded. -pre and mm -hmm. uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to get out because I'm sure I'm going to have to put together some uh, visuals for the audience so that when Richard speaks, I mean, you can see what it is he's talking about. So I would say probably with, within the next three or four weeks, I'll have that show out. Exciting. So, yeah, so the whole biological Paul, Billy thing, it's all tied into this this uh, this um, Paulism, which is a form of Luciferianism. Um, and it's, it, it's, it was intended to, and it's still in play, to change the reality. It's to foster in a new age. And there are those out there that will understand this uh, if you're into syncretism and, and stuff like that. Uh, the age of Aquarius, right? Harmony and understanding. That's what right. we're right now. Harmony and understanding. This is why we're seeing so 
much upheaval in the world right now. Now, some people are going to say, I don't like the upheaval. I don't like where they're taking us and so on. I'm one of these people that says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to learn as much as I possibly can and go along for the ride. We don't really have a choice. Well, there is a choice. Don't learn, put blinders on and go along for the ride or go along for the ride or die, I guess, because yeah. we're going along for the ride, whether we like it or not. I'd rather know a lot as I'm going along yes. for this ride. Yes. Thank you so much for saying that because I've told folks, I said, look, I'm not, I'm not being negative or, you know, or, or throwing the towel in, but there's no stopping this. I mean, what's mm -hmm. underway is underway. You can you help know? family members and friends possibly understand what's going on, but they, they might fight you. Yeah. I mean, look, my family fights me. I mean, my family doesn't, I don't even think they listen to my radio shows. <laughs> <laughs> Mine don't listen to me. Either, so. <laughs> you know, so um, the, the thing is to, uh, to learn as, as much as you possibly can about the truth and how it works, because this way you can take that knowledge and you can avoid the traps. Mm -hmm. Plain That's and simple. Kind of fun. They're playing a game with us, but in some way, if we know their playbook, right. It's all about, we can kind of play their game back and help ourselves and maybe even save ourselves. Well, and I would, I would argue that there's a part of the, uh, of the, um, the ruling class or the controllers that actually admires uh, people that actually have attained a certain amount of knowledge mm -hmm. and are able to push back. You see, they're like they're they're up there in their you know dark office with a very long table, smoking cigars in suits, saying, oh, "Look at that Mike Williams over there. He's got a little <laughs> backbone in him." <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. You know, I. <laughs> We'll let him uh, live for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give him more organic food. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's very interesting, Patricia, uh, this whole thing. And, you know, uh, like I said, the whole Paul is dead piece of this thing evolved for me. It, it really did. At first, I was just, you know, what happened and so on. And I was focused on the death of Paul McCartney. And then I got to the point where I just leapfrogged over it and said, OK, well, all right, he's not here anymore. So yeah, what does it mean? What does Why? it mean? Exactly. That's the important part. Why? What does it mean? Where is it going? Why did they do this? So social and cultural engineering, uh, for sure. Absolutely. We talked about it. Uh, the summer of love, psychedelics, drugs, free love, the breaking down of traditional religions. In fact, in the book, it states in one of the footnotes that Tom put in there that the Illuminati declared war on Christianity in 1962. I believe it. It says that in the book. I believe it. And uh, if I'm, I'm sure there are Christians listening to this show right now. And if uh, if you're a Christian, I mean, you could, if you pause for a second, you could take a look at what's happened as far as your religion has gone and all of the, the, the attacks that it has uh, been subjected to over the last uh, 50 to 60 years or so. Uh, look at what they've done to to the church. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not saying that the Vatican is good, but uh, what I'm saying is that there's definitely a concerted effort to to tarnish the traditional religions. Uh, we could say the same thing about Islam. Look at what they're doing to Islam. Islam and is another one. Relationships between males and females, and yeah. traditional roles. Although, yes, you can do other things, but a woman being a woman and a man being a man, and also what they've done to children. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in their, uh, in the mystery religions and in their, their, you know, their ideology and their belief system, um, androgyny is very important. And that's what Baphomet's all about, right? Baphomet is androgynous. Duality. Mm -hmm. Duality, as above, so below. And so what we're seeing is uh, they are imposing their spiritual belief system onto the masses. And, uh, and I know they're, Folks are probably thinking, well, Mike, do you subscribe to this? I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I subscribe to something or not. There's a lot of stuff out there that I don't like. Absolutely, I don't like. Uh, I do believe in the traditional male-female role. I do, you know. Uh, I mean, I'll just, I'll just say that, you know, I'll admit it. Me too. Um, I do, you know. Uh, but if, you know, if somebody has a different preference, uh, that's okay with me. I mean, you know, live and let live is really... 
Some would say what you're doing right now is uh, you're 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 you've bought into the tenets of Thelema simply by seeing the saying the live and let live thing you just added. But I know where you're going on this. I mean, I myself am a traditional woman and feel that way about men in my life being traditional men. Right. But if if I met somebody like a neighbor or something that was androgynous or you know whatever, what am I going to do? Do go burn down their house? I mean, that's right. the part where you are saying live and let live. It has nothing to do with Thelema, Satanism, or Luciferianism that I'm not going to spit in that neighbor's face. I can't do anything about that. It's a, it's respect for nice. another human being, right? Right. I mean, I have I have members uh, of my extended family that are gay. Uh, I love them. I mean, they, you know, they're people just like you and me. So, I mean, what purpose does it serve to, to go after them or to attack them? It, it, to me, it doesn't make any sense. It, it makes no sense whatsoever. And uh, we'll be a, a lot better world if we all just respected each other a whole lot more, which means even our, our, uh, our thoughts, our beliefs, our ideas, uh, and stop being so combative all the time. There's all this, this infighting and uh, this people just putting hate on other people. And uh, I mean, one of the things I wanted to just to mention here is that, you know, I know a lot of folks in the in the flat earth community, uh, they say, well, you know, they, they really get attacked for uh, for believing in the flat earth or the stationary plane or geocentrism, however, you know, you want to, to refer to it. Uh, and that some of that environment is very toxic, especially on YouTube. And, and you, I mean, you and I know this, right? Oh, yes. So uh, I've got to tell you, though, um, I was talking to Mark about this. If it's possible, I, I believe this topic here, this whole Paul is dead topic, is more toxic than what I experienced with, with Flat Earth. And my level of experiencing the toxicity with Flat Earth is not anything near yours or like David's and and and, and Jaren's and and the, and the other folks that are really more dedicated to to it than I am, but uh, I, I think that if, if we're if, if we can just have more respect for each other, and and just engage in civil discourse and try to have an open mind and and listen to the other person, you don't have to agree. Like I mentioned before, agreeing to disagree is okay. It's okay. Uh, it'll be a much better place, you know. And I know. It sounds like utopia, but well, you know. I have a hashtag that's in the description box of all of my videos. It's hashtag same team. Now that doesn't mean that research uh, that let's just use the Paul is dead researching. That doesn't mean everybody involved in that needs to agree on the exact specifications of Paul McCartney and et, et cetera, who's, who's playing the role and why, or in flat earth. Is it a, is it an infinite plane? Is it a dome? That's not it. Same team means we've all awakened. We all know right. something smells bad and we're all here to try to figure it out. It's okay for you to look into different things that I'm looking into or to believe different things than I believe. We're on the same team. We are trying to get out of this mess. So yeah, I mean, it would be a better place if we all took that on board. Be yourself, explore what you wish, but in the end, you're one of those people out here who's waking others up. So embrace that and enjoy that. Yeah, it's it's a tough business doing what you do and what I do. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot of uh, there's not a, like huge rewards to this, folks. No, you know, uh, not financial for sure, and definitely not a lot of kudos come your way. But no. it, in the end, when you lay your head on your pillow at night, I do feel that I'm helping in a small way, and that is really all you can ever ask of somebody. That's all you can do, and uh, you know we do get. And I know you do too. The uh, the emails that come in where people will say, thank you so much yes. for, right? And that gets you over the hump, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because you get all this other stuff. You get barraged with it all the time. You know, you're this, you're that, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, sometimes you think to yourself, and, and folks, I do think this to myself, okay? Why am I still doing this? Because Why am I still, I agree. Most of us who are watching this video now, who are content providers or even watch videos, have often said that to themselves. After yeah looking yeah. at videos and looking at hit pieces or getting weird comments on their Facebook or their Twitter or in their inbox, uh, wherever that may be, they just shake their head and say, 
I'm dealing with a bunch of crazy people who claim <laughs> to be awake. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. So, um, so the thing is, when we do get those, those emails that come in and say, you know, thank you so much. I appreciate your work. I appreciate what you're doing. And you'll even get emails that say, look, I don't agree 100%, but I mean, I, I really appreciate the work and the effort you're putting into it, whether it be Paul is dead, whether it be flat earth, whether it be geoengineering, vaccines, whatever it may be, JFK assassination, 9-11, you know, just pick one, uh, GMO, veganism, you know, uh, we're all faced with that, right? And you have to have thick skin and you develop thick skin very quickly in this business. You really do. And there is no financial rewards to this. Uh, just so folks know, uh, because a lot of times uh, I, I get accused of uh, you know, making money on my channel and- You are making... really Thomas, you Harriet. <laughs> oh my God, if somebody actually wrote that, they said that I'm actually Thomas, you Harriet. And yes. They said that I wrote memoirs. I thought to myself, it was very flattering, first of all. You're like, thank if, you, wow. If I, if I had wrote, written this book, okay. That would be the icing on the cake, but you know, I'm not Thomas U. Harry, obviously. That's a funny and, one. I've got, are you, you really are Linda Moulton Howe with lots of plastic <laughs> surgery. I'm like, wow, really? She's actually out there speaking somewhere on UFOs and you know. here you are. <laughs> here I yeah. am. So, yeah. Well. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, we have to uh, just keep uh, chugging along and, and we just have to say to ourselves that we're doing what we believe is the right thing to do because in in my heart i i just know i have to keep going i mean i just it's hard to explain why why do you keep going you know um i have this i'm not tied to the book in any way i'm not compensated uh, in any way uh my youtube channels aren't even monetized like my sage equate channel is not monetized my uh mccartney paul is dead channel is not monetized the only channel i have monetized and i only have four thousand subscribers is my my guitar channel mm -hmm. that's it and I have no idea how much revenue that is because it's only 4,000 subscribers. And I only put videos up, you know, intermittently when I decide that I'm going to build a guitar or- 10 bucks a month, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. It's, I don't, I, I, <laughs> Woo, this is going to sound really bad, but I don't even know how to check. Right. So I, I'm going to have to go figure out how to check and see if there's any money in, in the bank over there. If it is, it's got to be, I don't know, a hundred bucks. So yeah, so the, the payoff of this stuff, doing this stuff is not- uh, you know, we're not running to the bank and just, uh, you know, loading up our bank accounts. That, that's not happening. You're doing this because you feel it's the right thing to do. I mean, that's why I do it. I know that's why you do what you do. And everybody else who's doing this work, uh, why we do it. It's deeply you know? engaging, too, because during the down times when it just seems like everyone around you is fighting and pointing fingers at each other and they're truth seekers, too, you say to yourself, like you said, why am I doing this? I might pull away for a while. And I've taken breaks up to a month at a time. And during that month, I'm still on my phone, checking YouTube, seeing what videos have come out and itching to get back and interview this person or that person, yeah. talk about this subject or that subject. And I end up coming back. And it's only because this is so this awakening in general and all the various topics is so important to me. And I, I feel that all of us have something to offer. And if I step away, yeah, you know, there'll be like a bunch of other people who rise up and take my place and do better than me. But those who have been in it for a while and continue being here are a, a beacon of hope to other people who are just getting into it, who might be a bit afraid because they've seen the hit pieces, they've seen the weird comments, and they don't think they could stand up under that kind of pressure. So if you cave and leave, or if I cave and leave, or if Bob from Globusters or any of these other people who've been around for a long time do that, it will make some other people who are newly born into this feel less secure about putting their name and their face out there. Yeah. I, I In fact, I did a video today on Facebook where I said that uh, stop being a keyboard warrior. If you've got something to say and you feel like uh, what you have to say is important and it can add to making the world a better place, then do something about it. Put yourself out there. Uh, I'm not saying you have to put yourself out there in a big way, but fire up a YouTube channel, do a blog, uh, have a website, do these things. Um, because one of the things that happens like with this whole Paul is dead uh, piece of work that I'm doing is I get barraged with uh, with emails and PMs from people that are saying, oh, could you look at this? Um, can, can you check this out? Well, what do you think about that over there? And you know, when you, when you get like hundreds of these emails a week, 
there, there's no possible way to to be able to do this. And then you think to yourself, well, why am I taking on this responsibility? Why am I feeling like I'm the the end of the funnel? <laughs> You, you know, and it's going into my mouth like a fire hose full of information. And I've actually been pushing back on folks. I said, look, uh, you make some valid points. And do your so own I, research. <laughs> do your own research and put your own presentations together. Yes. Well, I'm not so sure I can do that. I don't know how to do it. Look, when I started doing this stuff, when I, the radio shows five years ago, I didn't know what I was doing either. None of us did. We all started with zero subscribers and I didn't even know how to do a Google Hangout. I didn't even know how to, I didn't even know how to use headphones. I had feedback. I mean, even if I was <laughs> in radio before, working at a radio station is not like doing a YouTube video. We all start with nothing and, you know, build as more people become interested in what you're putting out there and we all have something to offer. So yeah, like you, I encourage people to do it. Well, and, and people have asked me, they said to me, why, why is this even important, Mike? You know, it's, 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 who cares? It's, it's just a musician. It's just a band. And I said, the reason why it's important is because it's way beyond a musician and a band. So when you get into this, you're, you're learning about Tavistock. You're learning about the deep state. You're learning about the pyramid of power. You're learning about Crowley. You're learning about magic and the occult. You're learning about Luciferianism. You're learning about Satanism. You're learning about a lot of stuff. That's why it's important. There's there's, you... there's even fashion involved in this. And there's um, hairstyles involved in this. I mean, I know that sounds superficial, but I'm talking about people who are only in that superficial girly world. Right. They don't understand how the hairstyles of the Beatles changed, not just because it was interesting and cool to have a different look or, and the clothing, because the taste of society was being formed. And all of this is in this whole Paul is dead thing for anyone to explore based on what it is that interests you specifically. Yeah. I, I say to people, don't you want to know how social engineering and cultural engineering is implemented? Don't, don't you want to know that? Because it's going on right now. <laughs> it's going on right now. It goes you, on all the time, right? It's going on all the time. You watch something on television, uh, you're reading a newspaper, you're reading a magazine, uh, whatever. It's, it's around you all the time. It's 24, seven, 365 days a year forever. And the more you know about the tactics and the approach, the better off you're going to be. It's like we were saying before, you learn the traps, you know where the potholes are in the street and you can avoid them. So that's why it's important. So why uh, were women at one point directed to wear pants? Why were women at one point directed to wear mini skirts? It's all part of this same time continuum we're talking about that the Beatles played a huge role in with the free love and the uh, the the masculine feminine merging with the pants. I'm not saying women shouldn't wear pants or right. skirts, but what I'm saying is, is that we were directed to do these things. It's not just because we saw it on the cover of Vogue magazine, ladies. Yes, you did, but it got there for a reason in the Tavistock Institute and the Beatles. Yes, part of the reason why. Right, right. The Beatles, along with uh, other major bands that came out of the uh, the British invasion. Mm -hmm. you know, the Who, look at my guitar Zeppelin. right here that I've got. And Very <laughs> nice. I see that. It's an Epiphone. <laughs> which, which I can't play, which it was on my bucket list um, in for my birthday, October, February. 2015 and I found Flat Earth and started a YouTube channel in March or, you know, got into it in March of 2015. And I just never, never learned to play. I, and that's, that's a symbol of my laziness right there. Actually, it's a symbol of my mind engaged elsewhere, where before it was on more superficial things. And I know that you feel that way too, because you're a musician and I know I'm not, but I've got a guitar. Are there things, I know you still try to live your life. And part yeah. of the reason you're walking away from PID, Paul is dead, is because you need to engage in your real life living stuff, but you're still going to make videos on other topics. Do you feel that it's, um, your life's different since you started with your radio show and looking into truth? Do you think your life is objectively better or worse? It's better. Agreed. It's better because, um, because I'm not on the hamster wheel anymore. Yes, exactly. You're not a slave to the system. You're aware. Right. And I, I am aware. And so uh, actually I'm much more at ease. I don't have the, uh, the fear factor that uh, a lot of people have because they're watching the news incessantly. And uh, I, I just don't have any of that. Um, I stepped away from television a long time ago. Uh, when I got into the radio shows five years ago, I was doing the blog actually before that. I had I started the blog back in 2011, I think it was, 
So that's what, eight years. So I would say over the last eight years, Patricia, um, you know, as I got more and more acclimated to how the world really works, life got better. It got better because I wasn't focused on the things, the distractions and the inane nonsense that they want us to focus on, right? Those are just distractions, folks. That's to keep you from, from fulfilling your life. It's, it's to keep you on that hamster wheel, on that conveyor belt. They, they want to pull you away. I mean, what, we are in the Iron Age. So anybody who follows Martin Kenny's work, and in the Iron Age, we're actually transitioning out of the Iron Age now, and according to Martin, and we're now transitioning and segueing into the Bronze Age, which is supposed to happen December of 2020. It's not going to be like light switch on, light switch off. It's going to be a very methodical, slow transition. Kind of like but, getting into the age of Aquarius. It's not right. light switch on, light switch off. But Right. Yeah. So when they talk about the Mayan calendar back in 2012, the Mayan calendar was encoded. It was code for moving out of the Piscean age to the age of Aquarius. That's when the age and, of Aquarius formally came mm -hmm. into play. We all thought that, I did anyway, I won't speak for everyone, that something would happen that day. No, that, right. That things would change. And we woke up, oh, nothing happened. Oh, my calendar, that's just stupid. Right. That's right. And and so the thing is, the reason why uh, you, you feel, you know, it's, it feels stupid is because you're waiting for something to physically change. And that's the thing we have to understand. There is a spiritual aspect to our life that more and more people have got to plug into. So those who are spiritually connected will sense and understand that change in frequency. And right? you start changing. And you, you start don't even changing. You notice it. Exactly. And so, um, like, I wasn't aware of this, you know, years ago. I, you know, I, I was like everybody else. I was, I was in the matrix. Mm -hmm. But once I became aware of how this works, so we say that whatever they tell us, think the opposite, right? <laughs> <laughs> so when they start talking about the physical material world, and you have to start thinking about the spiritual and metaphysical world, that's what you need to do. Switch to thinking because they're trying to lure you into one direction when you really should be going in the other direction. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I would say that with the work that I've been doing, not, not just Paul is dead, obviously, because I've done a lot of other work, even though at this point, a lot of other people probably don't even know anything else I've done. <laughs> because you're, the, of, you're the PID guy. <laughs> yeah. That's another thing too. I um, want to see if I can get back to other stuff so I, I don't walk around with the PID guy button, you know? You're, you're like an actor now who uh, was famous for playing that one role and can't get hired unless they play that one role. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm like Captain Kirk, you know, William yeah, Shatner. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so things to answer your question, Patricia, uh, things got better, much better. Um, you know, I, I know you're a vegan. I'm not there yet. I'm a vegetarian. Uh, but just that shift alone, you know, going from, I didn't think I'd ever give up eating meat. You know, it just like wasn't in my, in my consciousness at one point. It wasn't in my awareness. I didn't even think about it. Like you didn't even think about All of these how you got the food, you know? Me either. I mean, with food before I became vegetarian, then vegan, or with any of it. I never thought about NASA or the shape of the earth or yep. Paul McCartney or any of these, the, the clouds in the sky, they look weird. There's X's in the sky. I just thought planes flew by and did that and just went about my merry way in the matrix. And then one day, gradually, I noticed no, one day I noticed that I had gradually changed the way I looked at the world. That's how it was. It snuck up on me. And yeah. then I couldn't deny it. And you can't go back and you don't want to go back. I realized uh, I made a shift when I would try to talk to uh, friends and family about things that I had discovered. And then had the very rude awakening because I was very naive. I thought that they would be all ears and they would listen and mm. they would find it interesting because I found it interesting only to find out that they thought I was crazy. Right. And these are people who'd known you for years and knew you weren't crazy, right? Right. They but knew all it wasn't. of a sudden they just figured you went nuts, right? That makes right. no sense. And that's, that's how you know, folks, that you've reached a point where you've started to awaken is when your friends and family think you're nuts. Okay. It's so a great that's... day. Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I reached that point at um, going back uh, several years ago. 
and uh, it was a shock at the time. I didn't like it. Uh, you, you don't like being rebuked by you know your own family or friends, but uh, you know twenty twenties hindsight. So when I looked back at it, I said, you know, actually it was a good thing. It was a uh, a turnkey moment in my life when I realized that hey, you know what, Mike, you might have turned the corner on this thing. You know, so you know you've made it when <laughs> yeah. you're rejected by everyone who you, <laughs> exactly. who you love. <laughs> So the other thing is uh, what I wanted to do uh, was just maybe mention a little bit. I want to thank you for um, having Jonathan contact me about the Mount Shasta. Oh, yes. Flat That'd Earth Conference. Great. Yes, that is coming up in September and you are going to be there. I'm going to be there and many other people are going to be there. Um, Jonathan Shalimar, weirdly enough, who's the organizer of the uh, Mount Shasta Conference, is my guest tomorrow, which is April 12, 2019. Excellent. So, okay. So we'll get to meet the man who's putting the Mount Shasta Conference together and find out what he's all about, why he's done it. And he seems like a very interesting individual. So we're going to be uh, on, on Flat Earth Mother Hopper Tales tomorrow with Jonathan Shalimar and myself. So that'll be good. But I do want to, before we close our show out, touch on the three different ways to read the memoirs of Billy Shears, because the first way you'd read it would be the way you read any book, just as right. it is. Right. So you will hear folks say that uh, memoirs is uh, fiction. And on the surface, they're justified for saying that because the book is classified as historical fiction. But the thing is, uh, memoirs is a... Masonic book, and it's written in layers, and there are three layers to the book. This is why Tom is not referred to as the author. He is referred to as the encoder. So Tom has special training that he received. I don't know, had to be way back when, I'm assuming. Uh, so Tom Thomas and I- Thomas Harriet, the author or encoder is a real person that yes. you have spoke with at length, and there are real photos of him as well. Yes, yes. So Tom's a real person. So yeah, that we should cover that first real quickly. Uh, a lot of times- and he's I'll, not you. <laughs> no, he's not me. I'm not Tom, you Harry. And right. uh, hey, Tom, <laughs> I'm sure Tom will watch this. Um, no, Tom's a real person. Um, I have had many communications with Tom over the last two and a half years. Uh, the communications were based upon questions I had about the book. So, um, and where Tom could, and he's been very graceful, he has responded and he's he's answered the questions that I've had. Uh, there are things that Tom cannot talk about because Tom has also signed non-disclosures and confidentiality agreements, is as he, has Billy. Is he himself illuminated? Uh, I think Tom's a Freemason. I don't think he's in the illuminated degree. So I would say that Tom is probably a 32nd or 33rd degree Mason. Okay, okay? that's a guess on my part. But, uh, but I do want to say that um, Tom has been great. Okay, and I, I don't have enough kind words to, to say, because as I've made my way through this, um, he has helped a lot to answer a lot of questions that, quite honestly, he probably didn't have to answer, to be quite frank. So um, he is a real person. Um, I did speak to Tom once going back, I guess, about a month ago. We had a conversation because I had some questions uh, with regard to the uh, the Crowley aspects of the book and I wanted some clarification on some things and so Tom and I spoke for about 35 40 minutes on the phone uh he has a Facebook page his face is up there you know he's got family members uh and so on so that whole thing there where people want to say he's he's not real and his name's an acronym his name is not an um uh, excuse me a um anagram his name is not an anagram his name is Thomas U. Harriet so um so Tom has his training in, in encoding, and uh, it's referred to as masterfully being written or masterfully disclosed. So the first layer of the book is you would read the book as you would read any book from left to right. The second layer is on each page of the book, uh, there are bolded out letters. And if you read those bolded out letters on each page, you get another layer of information. and the third layer is what they refer to as the acrostical, the acrostical code. So the acrostical encoding is the every uh, the odd numbered row, the first letter of every odd number row. If you read vertically down, you're getting even more information. 
So with each layering, the first obviously is just reading the book. So if you read the book left or right, and you don't read any of the second or third layer, you're going to get a lot of information out of the book. Then you take the next step, read the bolded out letters. Now you're getting more information. And if you then read the acrostical code, and actually Tom, they have a book they published where you don't actually have to sit there with a pen and pencil and write the letters out. I mean, they have a book, it's cheap enough. I think it's like seven bucks on Amazon. The cheating you can get the, version. <laughs> the cheating version, exactly, right? The cheat sheet. You can then read the acrostical. So when you take all three of those layers and you put them together, this is where the book pulls the truth through. So the initial layer, historical fiction, right? That's how the book is classified. But as you dig deeper, the truth emerges, comes out. And, um, and, and this is how Billy operates, by the way. I mean, Billy being who he is in the illuminated degrees is he is uh, highly trained and versed in the esoteric, in mysticism. Okay, so uh, say what you want about Billy Shears, Billy Shepard, Billy Campbell. Uh, I will say this, he's a very, very bright man. And um, so, I mean, he operates, he's always firing on, on eight cylinders. In fact, uh, Tom had said to me in, in one uh, email conversation we had going back a while that he's still very much on top of his game. And this was an email exchange we had last year. So Billy was uh, 81. His birthday is uh, September 9th, 1937. Hmm. And um, so he'll be 82 this year. And Tom said, you know, he's, he's still, he's still going. He's still very, very focused. I have a couple of questions. We yeah. know um, he married Linda McCartney and they had children, Stella McCartney, daughter who is a vegetarian and has a fashion line. And um, do you think Stella McCartney, his daughter, or any relatives know that he's not biological Paul? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they all know. So know. if there is revelation of the truth after... Sir Paul McCartney dies, Billy Shears. Will there be lawsuits against the family of Fall, fake Paul, and will all of their wealth be taken from them? No, no. Um, this is all contract based. So Billy signed a contract way back when, and that contract stipulates, you know, what he can do, what he can't do with regard to the character of Paul McCartney. He can use the name Paul McCartney because it is a corporate fiction. Like all of our names. I like all of our names. Okay. We have to distinguish between birth name and legal name. So Paul McCartney is his legal name. William Shepard or William Campbell is his birth name. Um. The other thing that folks have to understand, Patricia, is this all resides within the pyramid of power, okay? He is not going to be arrested. He's not going to lose his wealth. He was knighted, I mean, you know, so. He was knighted. And Billy has been, has done great work in the minds of the Illuminati on behalf of the Illuminati. Right. He's going to go out with a ticker tape parade. He's going to go out with accolades. He's going to go out high-fiving. And because... even people in the matrix who just, or even people who aren't, who are in the car and the radio is playing, or satellite radio, um, and they hear a Paul McCartney song, they're, you know, tapping their foot and singing yeah. along. He's yeah. created on a very superficial level, a lot of pleasure and happiness for people. Yeah, he, he's in that ruling class. He is in the ruling, a class, ruling class. He's part of the ruling elite. And, uh, you know, there's no way that his money is going, to be, uh, is going to be taken away from him. And the only way it can be is if he breaches his contract. You, you see what I'm saying? Okay. So as long as he adheres to the contractual obligations that he has, which means, you know, there's a, a certain path and timing for disclosure. And as long as he stays on that path, and I, 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 I know he, in the book he states he has attorneys that are looking at this to make sure that it all stays where it's supposed to stay. It's all going to work out. It's all going to work out. It's going to be fine. 
for him. Because uh, there are a lot of folks out there that are in this Paul is dead uh, community that believe that somehow you know, something's going to happen, like he's going to be arrested, he's going to be brought to trial and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. I mean, we anybody in the truth community, community should know that there's two realities. There's the world that applies to us, the law, laws and the governments and the police and all this stuff, the court system, right? And there's the world that applies to them. Those two worlds are not the same world. They are completely different. Completely Look different. At all the people who were knighted, who have, who it's come out that they're pedophiles. Um, right. Look at Jimmy Savile. Yeah, Jimmy Savile. Look at all of the things in the world where people who do wrong are applauded daily, and somehow what they do is spawn into being something good, and then the masses follow suit. Or it's ignored. Um, yeah, or it's ignored, exactly. Just yeah. pushed under the carpet. The examples I use, Patricia, is uh, John F. Kennedy was killed 60 years ago. 60 somewhat, maybe 60 years ago. Uh, what justice do we have for, for JFK and his family? Who, who's been arrested for the assassination of John F. Kennedy? I mean, we all know anybody, you know, that as a half a brain knows that it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald. It was exactly. a major conspiracy, right? So what happened to those folks? And what about uh, Hugh? That's one of those things everyone had been talking about, buzzing about in the yeah. past two years. With a, Hillary Clinton will be led away in handcuffs. And I just said to myself, no, she won't. No, never. No, the the Q, the Q thing is a regurgitation of uh, um, David Wilcock and uh, Ben Fulford from 2012, and they were talking mm -hmm. about mass arrests, right? So they recycled that that narrative again seven years later. That's what they did. It, it, there's no mass arrest, folks. It's a this distraction. Not, it's a distraction. It's to get your hopes up. It's to get you to continue to believe in that somebody else is going to step up to the plate. Somebody else, an authority, is going to take the baton and leave the parade. It's not going to have to be you. You don't have to do anything. You could just sit back and you could type away and you could put memes up on your Facebook page. It's not how it's going to work. So they put that out there ex to do exactly that, to keep you from acting, to keep you from, uh, from going out and being a, a true activist, to, to really speak your voice, right? The, people are relying on other people to do this. Um, 9-11 is another example, right? Now, we all know that 9-11 was an inside job. I mean, it wasn't 19 hijackers. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. But the people that were involved, nobody's been arrested. It's 18 years later. George Bush Jr. is still around and Dick Cheney's still around and Donald Rumsfeld is still around. There's been no justice. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm trying to make is not to train, you know, to paint this like, you know, this, the glass is half empty picture. It's just that these people operate in a different realm. They operate in a way in which the masses won't ever see them taken away in chains. So therefore, they are going to be comforted if they happen to see a conspiracy video about 9-11. They'll be comforted to know, well, they'd be arrested by now if they really did something wrong. So they didn't. So it was planes and it was yeah. hijackers. Yeah. So it's... Um, the yeah, system it's, protects them. Yes. And people need to understand that awakening will not be televised. It's up to you individually. Right. That's right. It, it is up to you. And the awakening first has to come through you doing your inner work. You have to awaken. You have to understand yourself first. What is your life purpose? What are you here to do? I mean, so many people don't even ask themselves that question. Pay bills or have fun. Those are the two things that most yeah. people would, and not people who are watching this, but most people would say that's what they, they need to make money and they want to have a good time. To survive. Mm. That's what they say. I need to survive, not that's thrive. Really horrible. Survive. And that's how many people think. So so the point I'm making is that we, we, have, we have two different worlds at play. It's the world of the elite class within the pyramid. And then there's the world outside of that pyramid. And if you're outside that pyramid, you have to play by the rules that they set in place. The rules that they set in play, place for us does not apply to them. The only time it applies to them is if you're in that pyramid and you screw up, and then you're out. Okay, this is one of the things that I've had a couple of folks contact me who are Freemasons, high level Freemasons, and told me that, if you're a Freemason and you let the cat out of the bag, right, 
uh, and you don't do it masterfully, then it's referred to as uh, sweeting, uh, feeding pearls to the swine. This is how they refer to it. Hmm. And you're out. You're immediately out. That's it. So you'll mysteriously die or you'll be charged with something that you didn't do and there'll be no way to get out of it or something you really did do will be revealed. Or they'll just give you the boot. You know, you know, it could be, it could be that, uh, that you don't get hurt in any way that, uh, you could just get the boots. In other words, your career dries up, mm. right? So if you're an entertainer or you're an artist and you're thriving and then all of a sudden you're gone, like whatever happened to so-and-so, I'm not saying that for everybody who just kind of disappeared, that's what happened, but that's, that's one of the alternatives where in other words, you know, the, uh, the gravy train is over. You get the boot, you're off the train, you're out. Uh, other times, if it's more serious, I guess, yes, they'll, 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 they'll put you through the system that the profane, that would be us, the unknowing, have it's to like contend a, with. It's like the, the, I hate the term goyim, but in a way it's the same as the profane. And they, the ones who are eliminated, are the sacred. Yeah. Or they think so anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, well, that's why they call themselves the Illuminati because they are illuminated. They are enlightened. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, that is what they believe, you know, their role is. And um, so, I mean, I, I have, we won't get into it here, but I have another view with regard to how that pyramid works. I believe that the pyramid of power changes its management system as it makes its way through the different ages. So in the Iron Age, it has to have a governance in place that ensures the Iron Age plays out the way the Iron Age is supposed to play out. The because everything's was. been planned out long ago, as you said. Yeah. And then once it moves into another age, like the next age is the Bronze Age, the all-seeing eye or the pyramid remains in place, but it changes its management system. It changes its governance in order to reflect now how the, the Bronze system needs to be managed. You see? I can see a new sign. It's a, a pyramid with an all-seeing eye, but right across it says, under new management. <laughs> under new management. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. And so if you play that out, then then it it would do that in a silver age and then into the gold age. Right. So my way of looking at this is that there is a governance. There is a management system that is in place to ensure that the reality that we incarnate into operates the way it uh, is intended to operate by, by the creator. Okay. And, um, again, this is a theory that I have. This is something that I'm giving more thought to. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. It's interesting. It's a fun ride. And yeah. I think that while we're on this ride that we really can't get off unless we take our own life, we should try to learn as much as we can about the twists and turns that are yet to come our way and what happened back there in our rear view mirror. Yeah, absolutely. And you've been wonderful in, in helping us all along that journey. And we're looking forward to all the wonderful things that you're going to do. Thank you for well, being here. You know, thank you, Patricia. I, I am very uh, select with who I, I interview with, especially with this whole Paul is dead thing. Uh, and so uh, I was, I'm really glad that you invited me to come on the show because it's always a great discussion and and we could talk about a lot of other stuff too. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting everybody uh, in September in Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta, here we come. I don't usually do those things, folks, and uh, but something within me was saying that uh, I should go, so I'll be there. Wonderful. Can't wait to see you. <laughs> that is Mike Williams, and you will find links to all of his work, his music, various places you can find him on his varying channels, the Mike Williams Paul is Dead channel, and his uh, Sage of Quay Radio Hour channel, and his Sage of Quay Radio Hour backup channel, and who knows what else is there. But it's all in the description box, and Mike, we will see each other soon, and uh, perhaps we'll do another show together. You never Absolutely. Know. I'm Patricia Steer, and this concludes this episode of Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. And until we meet again, and we shall, keep it flat.